Welcome to Grey Primer, a show that's mostly about miniatures. My name is Nick, I'm your host, and on this show I'm going to be building my biggest ever diorama. Now, I've built some pretty big dioramas in my time. An Imperial Knight tearing apart a Death Strike tank. An Orc Warband hauling a captured Chaos Forge Fiend. McFarlane size Space Marines battling with Gene Stealers. And most recently, an Iconoclast Warmaster Titan at the walls of the Imperial Palace on Terra. This one is going to be a little different and it is definitely not going to fit inside my IKEA cabinet, even if I happen to have space in there, which I don't. Maybe it'll fit on top, but I think there's going to be significant overhang the whole way around. So what's this diorama about? Well, we rarely see the arrival of the likes of space marines on a planet from the perspective of the local populace. Now what we normally see are these massive battle forces going at it against each other and some terrible and blasted wasteland and drop pods coming from space and tanks rolling and we never really see what happens to the locals unless they happen to be particularly heretical and why would we it's a war game you don't want to have a bunch of just locals wandering around but wouldn't it be interesting in a diorama just to see what that's like? What it's like for some local farmer with their kids and their livestock just going about their business and then all of a sudden tanks just roll into their farmland? That first exposure, that first contact to the forces of the Imperium. So my hope is that I managed to capture that for you in this diorama, that moment where hulking war machines meet normal folk who are just raising chickens and taking produce to the market to sell. All of that is coming up right after this. To keep things interesting, I wanted to make sure the tanks are nice and chunky. So I'm using a Land Raider Crusader and a Primaris Repulsor Executioner. Land Raider comes with a full color instruction manual and is a fairly painless build, especially for a tracked vehicle. It has plenty of detail for a kit that's, well, approaching a quarter century. And there are some lovely touches in the likes of the engine panel here with its purity seals and mechanicum plate. There's also a cool little CCTV monitor array as well, and some nicely detailed weapon systems. And yes, another Ultramarines decal sheet to add to the stack. The Repulsor Executioner is a tank I've been excited to build, and it also has a full color instruction manual just like the Land Raider, although its propulsion system is very different to put together. It's got an absolutely glorious turret, just look at that thing. It comes with a floating effect multi-angle base, and you can tell it's a more modern sprue by just how densely packed the components are. Yes, 2017 means that there's barely enough space to get your clippers in with all those weapons, armor panels, and miscellaneous gubbins. It comes with a round base and yet another sheet of smurf stamps. I had to travel all the way to Middle Earth to find a suitable civilian abode as there are very few other options from Games Workshop. I wish they would consider releasing more generic buildings like this rather than just more grand structures or ruins. Like where are all the cottages or hab blocks? Come to think of it, where are all the locals? I really struggle to find non-combatant miniatures for this diorama, but I'll get to that in a second. This house is fantastic by the way. The kit is packed with texture, detail and character. More of this please. The instructions are monochrome but easy to follow and the kit comes with things like a boat, a multi-part dock and lots of little accessories. And yes, I had to head all the way north from Nottingham to the quite wonderful Midland Miniatures in Tynan Weir to get myself non-combatants. Lady Barris is playing the farmer and mother in the diorama, and at the end of the main dock will be little Lord Grumpington playing the knight. Beside the mother, Edward will be standing guard with his trusty teddy bear. And then finally, boy running with stolen apple will be legging it through the garden. Middle of miniatures make 28mm scale models cast in white metal and are well worth checking out. What a lovely family about to have an unexpected morning. Okay, so let's get everything we need to make this concept a reality. In my top drawer I have 5,000 unused Ultramarines decals, but also some gorgeous Forge World transfers. They're expensive but wonderful quality and you get a bunch on these A4 sheets. 
To stay organized, I have a place for everything, even though by the end of this diorama, nothing will be in its place. And I'll spend half a day resetting this workspace. Up here I have all my basing materials, from tiny pebbles to this weird lichen stuff. I've got self-adhesive flowers and a whole bunch of many-colored flock. I'm also going to need a lot of paint, so I'll grab enamels and dry pigments, and I'll try dirty down for the first time. I'll need my grayscale selection and metallics as well, and liquid pigments too. I'll need foam to build with and on top of, and in my world here is what it takes to construct a diorama as ambitious as this one. But before I do anything I have to pick some tools, and as much as I'd love to hatch it off all the mold lines, I'm going to turn to my old faithful, my Stanley folding pocket knife. In my opinion, the very best hobby knife in the world. I find these cool little decoupage scissors in a craft store and they're perfect for decals. And I'm sure I'm going to find some use for the reciprocating saw. So I've acquired an unreasonable collection of clippers over the years, especially when you consider I only ever use three of these, the wire cutters, the absolutely beautiful Zuron 410s, and then these fancy little Tamiya ones. And the others rarely get a look in, but I'm always open to trying out new tools. And these pruning shears, well, they actually give a nice enough cut. But for modern sprues like the Repulsor, there's no way they'll fit into the tiny gaps. Sorry. And then we get to the brushes, and this looks ridiculous, but what you see here is a mix of bristle types, head shapes, belly widths, levels of springiness, and to be honest, I probably used most of these in the two months the diorama took to complete, apart from the Bob Ross 2 Inger. The Green Stuff World Paint Spinner is one of the best tools I've bought and is highly recommended. And the rest of these tools just make life easier during a diorama build. I just wanted to take a moment to show how I make more realistic bendy radio antenna for tanks. The supplied ones are too stumpy and thick for me, and I like antenna to look like they aren't going to break if the tank drives through trees or through a house. So I select this soft wire uh, to do the job for me. What I do next is just clip off the existing plastic antenna as close down into the main unit as sort of looks right. I straighten the wire carefully as this stuff can be really sharp and then I clip off small sections. Zing! That went flying around the room. I match a pin vise drill bit diameter to be slightly larger than the wire and then carefully drill out the holes. I use super glue for the wire as plastic cement won't do anything with metal. And before that I use pliers to free up a jammed super glue lid. You're getting all the little pro tips in this video. And once it's dry I can bend it to taste. And you can see how it looks in this repulsor turret. The Land Raider has bendy antenna and I also added some jerry cans and gear stowage. The repulsor is pretty much stock apart from the antenna and barbed wire around the main gun barrel. The home is lovely and I just wanted to show it again. Alright. The bits are built, so now it's time to set up my wet palette and get some painting done. Redgrass Games palettes are perfect for me, and I love this smaller sized one. I peel off the absolute chaos from my last project and grab myself a fresh sheet of hydration paper. I liberally soak the sponge and then pop on the fresh sheet. I nudge the air bubbles away and then pour off any excess liquid, and once that's done, well, we're pretty much ready to go. Happy days. So I am a complete novice airbrush user and I make a lot of mistakes as you'll see in a moment, but I'm learning as I experiment and I'm starting to have a little bit of fun with it. Putting down base coats or primer is where my skill level is currently at and for larger areas it's a major time saver. I use Green Stuff World's Walnut Ink to shade all the lighter woodwork on the dock and on the house and it works beautifully. The key thing to watch for here is that it's not pulling anywhere that you don't want it to. Citadel contrast paints can need some serious shaking to get them to a usable standard, but the Green Stuff World paint spinner makes short work of the process. And these AK interactive paint bottles come with mixing balls in them so that helps too. But you can see how insanely quick this thing spins. I use Saigor Brown as the contrasting wood colour and I'll shade this with null oil once it's dry. I also painted this roof with Contrast Black Templar, but I didn't film it. MIG Subtle Dirt is such cool stuff, it's just grime in a tub and brilliant for naturally weathering white paintwork. 
Quickly mix it with a tailier brush to save yourself a lot of shaking. This is enamel based, so thin with mineral spirits, and please keep the tailier brush out of your mouth if you have a habit of holding tools in your mouth when you aren't using them. This stuff tastes nasty. Uh, so I've been told. I think AK Moss Deposits is a brilliant paint and just great for adding in an additional layer of realism. I slap it on and make sure to push it into all the nooks and crannies between the tiles. And then I'm going to use mineral spirits to take off the moss on the top surfaces but leave all the stuff down in the gaps. Mineral spirits can be pretty nasty, especially when you spill them, like this. And you don't want to get this onto your clothes or skin. But by not wasting the soaked up spill that was on this kitchen towel, I found a much quicker way of removing excess paint. Happy little accidents. Thanks, Bob Ross. I even used the last bits of excess moss deposits from the roof to add a little rot to the lower woodwork. Gamers Grass do some brilliant tufts in various lengths and colours, and I thought this stuff looked most like the moss you see on some people's roofs. I cut it down into tiny bits and pieces and used just a little bit of super glue to carefully attach the tufts to the roof tiles. It's a small detail in the diorama that most people won't even spot, but I love taking care of details like this that can connect a fantastical diorama a little bit more to reality. Green Stuff World make these cool little clear wine bottles in resin, and I use Tamiya Clear Red to make it look like they're full of red wine, cherry aid, blood, or whatever you want. It's just another bit of produce for the family to load into their boat for sale at market, and I think it actually looks pretty cool. Even though all of the Tamiya Clear paints are goopy nightmares to work with. When I'm done with a wet palette sheet, I like to record it in the sketchbook by taking a stamp and noting what I mostly used that sheet for. This is almost always a messy process, but I find it's a bit of fun. And it is interesting as a reference at the end of a project, especially when you look back at the color choices you made for whatever part of the project you were working on. I really love the Lake Town House, and it's unlike anything I've painted before. It's also great value for money. I added in a few extras, like the hair hung up on the wall and some tools, and of course the boat is full of fish, eggs, wine, and there's even a barrel of beer in there. And of course, we have Camilla the Chicken guarding the outhouse. I really messed up when starting to paint the tanks. My paint consistency was all wrong for an airbrush and it was watery and it was spitting everywhere. I think the pressure was wrong as well, but I rescued it with a coat of Vallejo Model Air Olive Green, which saved my bacon. And it was the perfect consistency for airbrush right out of the ball. For weapons and exposed metal work, I use Vallejo's Metal Color Gunmetal Gray. Metal color separates drastically, so shake it or mix it well before use. By the way, I always look awkward when painting on camera, but I'm normally much more precise than this footage would suggest. I paint the tracks with the same color, and also the repulsor panels on the hover tank. These are Dark Angel's tanks, and these are the three main colors I'll be using. You may also notice there's a Grey Knight's badge on one door of each tank. So the backstory I made up for these tanks is that they are veterans of the Pandoric campaign against Abaddon the Despoiler's Chaos Forces during which the Grey Knight and former Dark Angel Epimetheus was captured and presumably killed by Abaddon. Both of these tanks were involved in the extraction of several Grey Knights who had become overrun by Chaos forces, and the icon serves to recognize the act of valor and heroism and also the loss shared by both chapters through the death of Epimetheus. And because the tanks have seen a lot of action, I use a lot of silver paint to just scratch them up a bit. Green Stuff World's black suit is brilliant for showing vent and exhaust suit and also carbon buildup around weapon barrels. It dries super matte and is slightly textured. Just don't use your fanciest brushes when you're applying this stuff. I'm a fan of the effect and you don't have to be too tidy when you're painting it on. Kind of just slap it into those spaces. As a side note, Green Stuff World's brush rinser looks so cool in slow-mo, and it has become another essential part of hobby kit for me. Now I'm going to stick on all the weapons, and I'm actually using super glue for this process because plastic cement doesn't work well on heavily painted plastic surfaces. They've just created too much of a barrier between the two raw plastic bits, so uh, super glue tends to work a lot better. To designate the Dark Angel's fourth company that these tanks belong to, I mask off part of the door and use Golden So Flat Red 
to make my stripe. Little bits of paint do get in under the masking tape, but can be mostly wicked away using a wet brush. I can also fix mistakes using the olive green base color. And while I have it on the palette, I can also use it to weather up the stripe a bit. I use silver to show deeper scratches, and I'll also use some rust on this later on. And the silver is great for picking out areas on the tank which will experience greater wear, like steps and handles and edges and things. I measure up where I want the decals to go on both tanks and then check the measurements against the decal sheet. I prepare the surface on the tank with Vallejo Decal Fix, nudge larger details into position with a fingertip, and then soften and set the decal to give it a painted on look with Microsol, which seems to work really well. The gloriously gross AK Interactive track wash is just perfect for adding realism to tank tracks and any excess can be easily wiped away or brushed off with mineral spirits. And here is the finished Land Raider Crusader complete with some really icky mud effects and some additional weathering. No mud on the floating tank however but plenty of scratches and rust and I think it looks deadly as well. Let's get into the farmland and lake shore now. Originally I wanted to base this diorama on a section of river, but adding the opposite bank was making the whole thing just too large, too wide. And I knew it was going to be big, especially with the two tanks being complete monsters, but building an entire extra river bank seemed unnecessary. Instead I went with a lakeshore idea, which of course allows the lake town house to live up to its name. For the farmland I used high density EVA foam yoga blocks, yes indeed, which are easy to carve, suffer from nearly 0% retained deformation when compressed, and are often reasonably priced. The ones I used are non-reactive to super glue and spray can primer, which is a, just an added bonus. I mark out the position of everything with chalk marker before carving the shape of a gently sloping bank into the foam. I don't throw away anything, so I use the offcuts of this process to make the rest of the bank, and I make sure to check the positions of all components as I continue to work. I mark out where the land raider is going to be sitting on this piece of foam, and I also put down where the, the remaining curve of this lake bank is going to be. I mark where the tank tracks are the tree where it's going to live and this little stone wall I make sure that that's marked in too and also the gate which closes everything off. I keep all the little foam shavings handy because they work really well as little rocks in the terrain and sometimes it, it may just be a mossy covered bump or it might just be an exposed piece of granite. I use BSI super glue and accelerant spray to get all the sections quickly locked into place. And I do yet another component check with all the relevant bits and pieces just to make sure I'm still on track. And this gives me an opportunity to turn back before I go into building the wall or start to prime the whole thing. It also gives me the first proper feel of whether or not the diorama is on course to live up to the original concept. I add in all of the villagers as well just so that I can do a little shaky cam fly around to see if it's hitting the right level of impact or if there's anything I need to fix. 1998 Citadel PVA glue emerges from the archives to stick together the two largest components of this project and does a great job. I then used super glue and matchsticks to make myself a garden gate, but not before I googled images of garden gates. It's amazing how often you forget what simple things look like when you're trying to make them from scratch. Just try drawing a bicycle without looking at reference images. For the log steps on the dock, I cut up some Tamiya 135 scale telegraph poles. These work really well, even if they have horrible mold lines. I use a rotary tool to grind down the surfaces of the steps, which would experience the most wear from countless feet running up and down them. I then moved on to the part of the build I was most excited about, building my little stone wall, which marks the boundary of the farmhouse garden. And I make the wall using individual stones from an aquarium range of gravel. Each stone was dipped in PVA glue, then stacked on top of each other, and it was a long, but honestly, a very zen building experience. I used a whole bunch of colors to represent the myriad tones found in a natural stone wall, with lots of browns and grays of course. 
While building and painting the stone wall were both very long processes, I enjoyed the experience immensely. I put an audiobook on and lost myself in the Siege of Terra. I reached for an old favorite when painting the farmland, Vallejo's brown mud. The color and texture are just perfect for the work I do, and I think this is actually my fourth bottle of this stuff. I use a flock mix that is made up of two different types of model railway flock, one part fine green, one part mossy lawn, or something like that. The wet mud grabs and holds the flock nicely without needing to use glue. Even so, I'll spray mist the entire thing with water down PVA glue later just to lock it in. I apply some Green Stuff World purple blossom tufts to add a little color to my garden, and also plug a little bit of Green Stuff World shrubbery into the grass to add another texture and point of interest. Dirty Down is a brilliant range of high matte water soluble paints that can add ultra realistic moss, rust and verdigris effects. They are fantastic to work with and my favourite is the rust one which is indistinguishable from real rust once it's dry. Just apply Dirty Down where you think the effect would naturally occur in the real world and don't be afraid to experiment with it. In nature, many things scale up and down while retaining the same structural familiarity. Tiny sticks look very much like towering trees. This is very handy in scale modeling as a short trip to the garden paid dividends with this very tree-like twig. I added a cutaway second layer of Army Painter XPS foam to represent the true level of the lake on this side of the diorama, which gives a clear contrast to the waterless exposed lake bed underneath the repulsor tank over here. And to create the transition from one side to the other, I used air drying clay. This brand is new to me and immediately grossed me out. I think Scott from Miniac would call it moist. That said, it's surprisingly dry inside and it actually sculpts really well, as I push the shape of gradually ascending wave levels into it. It left me with very green fingers, which is a first for me, as I'm so bad with plants that I can kill a plastic ivy from Ikea. Green Stuff World's Sculptor Vaseline is great for sculpting and helps with blending clay together smoothly. I add in the repulsor for a moment just to check my work and I think I have the effect just where I need it. I drill little holes into the support beams of the house and outhouse and add pins so that they can be added to the diorama without needing to glue them in. It's tricky to glue stuff onto heavily flocked surfaces without creating a weak bond or disrupting the flock itself, so I prefer to pin. Camilla the chicken will have a nice view of the lake from here. I coated the lake area with Vallejo Pacific Blue, which goes on light and dries dark. I added Vallejo Foam Effect and still water to complete the look of disrupted water and an exposed lake bed. And with that, I'm calling First Contact complete. A young family fills their boat with produce to sell at the local market across the lake. The mother is dressed in her finest frock, ready for a day socializing with the other villagers, while the children buzz around with excitement. But a few seconds later, a pair of dark angels tanks hurtle up the lake shore towards this peaceful scene. The mother cries out, the little boy runs fast through the garden, and the knight on the dock plants his feet, raises his wooden sword, and prepares to engage the angels of death. Will the tank stop in time, or maybe avoid the farm with death driving, or will they simply power through, barely noticing the tiny homestead and its family? We'll never know for sure, but I'm so glad you chose to spend some time with me today. If you enjoyed this diorama build, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. I appreciate each and every one of you and love chatting with you in the comments. Until the next time, take care and bye bye.